So I think we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, we're very pleased to have uh, Nolan Picker uh, talk to us today about his program related to rare earth elements in lignites in North Dakota. Uh, Nolan is a research engineer at the Institute for Energy Studies at the University of North Dakota. And he received his uh, bachelor's and master's at the University of Louisville and is currently pursuing his uh, PhD at the University of North Dakota. Uh, so he is uh, leading many programs um, at the Energy uh, Institute related to rare earth elements, extraction, purification, bench scale, bench scale studies, and uh, techno-economic analysis. And um, we benefited greatly from his NETL reports when we were putting together the proposal for DOE and uh, Nolan is um, one of our collaborators on that work. And uh, a few other people um, on the call are also involved, including Charles Nye from the University of Wyoming and uh, Peter Warwick from USGS. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Nolan, and looking forward to your presentation. Thanks again, Bridget. And um, make sure everything goes off without a hitch, setting it up. Can everyone see the presenter mode? Looks good. Thank you. Okay. So, Bridget said, I'm Nolan Thaker at the University of North Dakota Institute for Energy Studies. Today, I'll talk uh, a little bit about the our lignite rare earth element exploration and extraction, what we've been looking at, both essentially in the cold geologically, as well as um, extracting it, what it takes based on how it's associated, and also um, what our process looks like. Kind of disclaimer for this, this is based on the North Dakota Williston Basin lignites. UND at the very least hasn't done a whole lot of sampling of other lignites, particularly the Gulf Coast lignites. We've done some sampling mainly just to see rear earth levels, but we haven't done exhaustive sampling. So we'll be focused on that, ho hoping that they're relatively uh, interchangeable, but obviously there may be differences. So just pointing that out. Ken has an overview of what I want to talk about, go over some background with lignite chemistry and rare earths. Guess and most of you on the call know what lignite is and know what a rare earth is, but still just going through it just to make sure everyone's on the same page. How the rare earths and critical minerals bind um, in different forms in non coal ap applications, then also in coal. And then talk about some general um, exploration findings of the North Dakota lignites, both the rare earths, critical minerals and the stratigraphy and really what elements are of interest, what elements we're finding in lignites and targeting and what I think should be included if we're looking for new sampling. And then finally start looking at extraction from the lower end colds, the behavior of the rare earths, um, how they're extracted and from what forms they get extracted based on the association type within the coal trends of extractability across the series, and then kind of a quick summary of the UND process, and then plenty of time for questions. So getting in some background. Just because I don't know exactly what the audience is, I just wanted to cover this real quick, the lignite chemistry. Lignite is a younger coal, hasn't gone through the complete coalification process to the subbituminous and bituminous or anthracite coals. And essentially, as we're doing that, we're removing heteroavins from the carbon matrix, so the younger coals like lignite are going to have a lot more oxygen, hydrogen on their carbon backbone, and then have a lot more moisture as a result of that oxygen, hydrogen functionality. And really what this means, there's a lot more organic functional groups that exist in the young coal matrix that no longer exist in the, as you get into the bituminous anthracite, anthracite coals. And really these functional groups, Two major pieces of those are the humic and fulvic acids contained within the lignite. These are long chain um, organic acids that primarily have phenolic or carboxylic acid, um, essentially splinter groups off of them. And as you colify, a lot of those carboxylic acids are gonna get kicked off as CO2 or phenolic groups get kicked off as water. And so you're going to lose that functionality group over time as the material colifies, whereas essentially in lignite, a lot of that still remains. So it's kind of going into that with, with some numbers. So for instance, for lignite, we still have a lot of carboxylic acid. There's 30% oxygen or so. 
most of that oxygen or a fair amount of that oxygen is tied up in functional groups, the carboxylic acids and the phenolic OHs. Um, once you get the subbituminous, you're going to have very little carboxylic acids left, still have some, some OH groups around. But then once you're in bituminous, your carboxylic acids have essentially been removed. They're very rare to find. And if you have rare earths, they're likely going to be mineralized at this stage. Um, what the, so these OH bonding, what this allows for is you can have these hydrogen atoms get replaced with suitably acidic materials, other hard Lewis acids like those left side of the periodic table metals, um, your group one, two, and then your early transition metals like the rare earths. Background into rare earths. This is from NETL. Marianne always has the best images for this. So I usually just steal them from her. Um, this, all of the labeled elements right here are the critical minerals as defined by the Department of the Interior. Um, rare earths are scandium, yttrium, and the lanthanide series with lights essentially being europium to the left heavies being gadolinium to the right, and typically scanning and yttrium are included with the heavies. Um, rare earths are so named as a group because of their chemical similarities. Essentially, scanning yttrium and all the rare earths have very um, close affinity with each other. And so typically they're difficult to separate, but functionally, when I'm gonna be talking about a, a rare earth and how it interacts, it's fairly accurate to define the entire group by one broad stroke um, because they act so similarly. As a note, promethium in essence doesn't exist. It's an unstable element. So while it is a rare earth, I won't be mentioning it and you won't see it in any analysis. And then just as a note, here's your actinide series. Thorium and uranium are the two actinides you may see and those will come up later. Uses and markets multiple different uses around um, glass polishing, metallurgical alloys, ceramics, phosphors to a far less extent now, mainly because LEDs won the, the lighting war in essence on which um, process was, which technology was gonna make the most sense, mainly because of europium's price. But the major sector that really matters for rare earths is the magnets. And that's where the, most of the rare earth value really gets derived from. And the four elements, the magnets, the magnet metals, as I'll refer to them later, are neodymium, praseodymium, terbium, and dysprosium. And these go into neodymium, iron, iron, boron magnets. Praseodymium can get admixed with neodymium to dilute some neodymium and add some other effects. And terbium, dysprosium can get added to change the um, temperature, the Curie temperature and some of the temperatures of operation of the magnets and or their strength. Why this is so important, rare earths are the strongest permanent magnet known and about 10 times stronger than your ferrite magnets. And there's no really economic replacement for them. The only really closer permanent magnet that's made at any industrial scale of the samarium cobalt magnets, which still are a rare earth magnet, but they are far more expensive because of the cobalt composition. And so really the neodymium iron boron, if you have a wind turbine, a um, the direct drive motors for wind turbine, if you have electric vehicle car or drives, if you have disc drives for hard drives, typically they're gonna have neodymium iron boron magnets in it. And so as a result, in the lanthanide series, if you're looking for a valuable rare earth deposit, these are the four elements you want. And in essence, the rest of the elements in the series, you can largely ignore from a economic perspective. So what are the favorable deposits for rare earths? As I mentioned, your magnet metals, your higher value targets. So you want these, unfortunately, Nature isn't so kind to give us those four elements alone. You, you always get all the rare earths together and typically they form in two general distributions, a light rare earth rich or a light concentrate and a heavy rare earth rich or a heavy concentrate. I think comparative minerals are like a monazite or bastonzite for the light rare earth rich and a xenotime for the heavy rare earth rich. So the light rare earth rich can contain greater than 90% of the lanthanum to neodymium. Um, those four elements. And so that's 
fair amount of neodymium and praseodymium, but in essence will include virtually none of the heavy rare earths in any appreciable quantity. The heavy concentrates will include up to 35 to 50% of the samarium to lutetium and yttrium as their material. And so those are gonna be much more desirable, mainly because they'll have a lot more terbium and dysprosium, and those are the rarest and highest value rare earths on a per mass basis outside of scandium, which in a conventional mine isn't really targeted because they have a lot of trouble actually recovering it in an economic fashion. <clears throat> Minerals that we're looking at for binding, typically want to bind as phosphates, uh, some as carbonates, um, so they'll mimic calcium and then the iron, titanium, the ilmenite equivalents in these minerals and are typically found alongside those. Additionally, the actinide series elements, the, which are radioactive, the uranium and, thor and thorium are the only naturally occurring ones, also bind similarly. So radiation concerns in rare earth mining is a ubiquitous problem. There is always these actinides, typically alongside the rare earths, and so if I extract the rare earths, I extract the actinides, and then I'll have radiation concerns later on in my process. Something to note, and it is a fairly big concern of the process and an environmental concern downstream as you start increasing those concentrations. However, minerals isn't the only binding mechanism that's of interest to the metallurgical industry for sure. They also are interested in how they bind to an organic species particularly for liquid liquid or solvent extraction extractions. And so what you want here is the, the rare earth group as a whole to bind in one area of your operating curve suitably away from all your other elements. And typically your weak acid extractions, your phosphonic carboxylic acid groups are what separate that and have some separation from your rare earth elements to your other elements. Examples of this, Two phosphonics are your DEPA and your Cyanex-272. Two carboxylic acids are your Versatic-10 and your naphthenic acids that are used. And in all of these, rare earths are typically one of the most strongly bound elements on this extractant or resin, along with other polyvalent islands. Typically, your strongest bound are going to be your iron, uranium, thorium, aluminum, and rare earths. And so those are typically your competitor elements when you're looking at these solvent extract and extraction change or ion exchange resins for coarse separation, where you're just trying to get a pure mixed rare earth stream. Not really gonna be focusing on a fine rare earth refinement where you start separating the uh, lanthanides from each other, but that's another topic for another day. <clears throat> so rare earth binding and coals. Coal is a very heterogeneous material. There is a lot of different things in coal. Coal is not just a black rock. There's minerals. There's lots, there's different organic phases. There's clays. There's minerals that were deposited with the coal. There's minerals that formed with the coal. So there's a whole lot of different things that happen in coal. And rare earths can take a lot of different forms. They could be minerals that formed or that were deposited with the coal in a volcanic ash, like a tonstein. They could be minerals formed from rare earths that were bound organically that then got kicked off during coalification and formed carbonates likely with CO2 present. <coughs> you can have some action where you bind to your clays in sort of an ion absorbed fashion with the particularly the kaolinitic clays. And then you also have organic binding mechanisms similar on those um, carboxylic acid groups that you have for the extractants. You can bond to the same carboxylic acid groups that are found in humic acids, for instance, in coal. So for the rare earths, to find a usable deposit, we need a strong distribution coefficient from the rare earths to all the other majors that are usually hundreds to thousands of times more abundant in these materials to see an elevated concentration in a material that's worth looking at for extraction and recovery. So two kind of ways you can look at that, you can find a substantially mineralized section of rare earths, like if you have a really great tonstein that has a lot of rare earths running right through a coal, 
that's going to be great. And you're going to have the uh, rare earths in that volcanic ash. Otherwise, you need a substantial concentrating factor over your majors, calcium, sodium, iron, whatnot, in your coal somewhere else. So where this concentrating factor exists, or so we proposed and theorized and looked into, is in those organic complexes. So once again, on the young coals like lignite, the carboxylic acid binding sites exist and in pretty high abundance. There's a lot of them in the coal. <clears throat> for the carboxylic acids, there's a much higher binding selectivity for your tri and tetravalent ions over your mono and divalent ions. And so you, over the period of millions of years, will slowly switch out a lot of your um, mono and divalents for these trivalents. And you'll get a lot of organically associated um, iron, aluminum, rare earths, et cetera, on the carboxylic acid bonds. Uh, and so one major um, theory that we've proposed for at least the North Dakota lignites that we've looked at is that a common way that the rare earths got into the coal wasn't that they were deposited with because tonsteins and coal is fairly rare in North Dakota. And even the couple that we've seen, they're typically not very rich in rare earths. And so what we've seen is that it's more likely accumulation over time as the humic acids pick up more rare earths, reject more sodium and calcium and whatnot as a method for concentration. And when I get into the stratigraphy, I'll kind of explain why we've looked at that. And then looking at the graph on the bottom right, there is some mineralization that exists. So the black bars are an acid soluble mineral, but they're not an organic complex. Red is the organic complex and blue is just insoluble in um, one molar HCl. And so the acid soluble minerals are likely some form of a monazite or some form of a carbonate. And you'll see this trend of lots of lights and then drifting off and essentially no heavies. You'll see this exact curve pop up later and I'll reference it again, just for reference. But as you can see with the organic complexes in lignite, the vast majority of the rare earths are in organic complexes and particularly in the heavy rare earth sphere. There's a lot of organically bound heavy rare earths, almost no mineralized, and you can get 90% of them whatnot if you really put your mind to it with still just one, eight, one molar HCl. Um, noting here that there is a little bit of a weird aberration around neodymium and samarium. Neodymium and samarium are actually the two most strongly bound elements to carboxylic acids apart from scandium. And so you do see this little small dip and that's common across all the lignites we've seen to date where these, where you have a small reduction in this area of the curve and extractability. And so that's fairly common and it's mainly just because those compounds are fairly stable. <clears throat> So what are some effects of this organic binding mechanism? So once again, if rare earths had a path to get into the coal, they can be concentrated with carboxylic acid sites along with other polyvalents. However, if you remember, I mentioned those phenolic OHs that exist, and there's a lot of those too. Those can replace their H pluses with sodiums and calciums. So you do have a lot of other elements around they're, they're not the only organically associated element, but they're usually some of the only organically associated elements to carboxylic acids. However, when you're extracting them, it's not gonna be able to just extract one and not the other. So you will kind of get the whole bag. Um, as a note, likely because of that uh, light rare earths being able to mineralize with the heavy rare earths are more, more organic stable, we do have, we have found that the heavy rare earth to light rare earth ratio is improved in lignites. Just as a point of 80 samples we took from active mines and outcrops, only 9% of the lignites were at or below the upper crustal continental average ratio for heavy to lights, um, which is about 0.37. Most of them were in the 0.5. Multiple lignites were above one, where it's more heavies than lights. So they're certainly heavy concentrates. 
And then even on the ele elevated concentrations like nights where typically the elements that concentrate you are lanthanum and cerium, still three quarters of the lignites over 150 ppm whole coal basis were more heavy concentrated than your upper crustal continental ratio. And as a note, your light concentrates are far below your UCC ratio. Your light cons are typically a 10 to one or more light to heavy, so a 0.1 heavy to light ratio. <clears throat> kind of a comparison to your con some of the conventional ores out there. This is what your typical light concentrate looks like. A whole bunch of cerium, a whole bunch of lanthanum, lots of neodymium, praseodymium, and then your heavies are a tiny sliver that's like three to five percent of your total rare earth mix. Comparing that to your iron absorbed clays in south southeastern China, <coughs> which is a heavy concentrate, here your heavies are more than half of your total rare earth blend. Your lights are less than half, and for the North Dakota lignite. We're kind of in between. We've got about 40% heavy, 60% lights. And so we are far more on the heavy concentrate side. And as you can see, dysprosium is a decent share of the wedge. Usually we've seen it about three to 5% of the rare earths in lignite. Whereas for the ion absorbed clays, it's only about six to seven. So we're on that spectrum in terms of uh, distribution as compared with the bastinocyte or monazite ores elsewhere where your dysprosium is likely going to be below a half a percent and not really present there in any measurable amount. So going more into sort of the geologic exploration where we've been heading from here. So our sampling to date has primarily been outcrop sampling. We've taken thousands of samples. We've only had about five to 10 drill cores, primarily of active mines to get those non-weather samples. We have taken high wall samples from the mines, which are not as weathered as your outcrop samples, but depending on mining rates, whatnot, those could still sit out um, exposed for some time and weather a tiny bit. And our focus on sampling has primarily been active mines and or areas of known high rare earth concentration. This is particularly the Hell Creek, Hell Creek strata in southwestern North Dakota. The Harm and Hansen and H bed lignites there are very good for rare earths and criticals. So we focus there. Um, as a note, in the active mines we looked at, if you look in general, they're relatively low rare earth content, nothing to write home about, but you can have some elevated concentrations, particularly exceeding that 300 ppm magic number DOE set um, at some of your partings, thin seams, margins of your seams. So, Getting into the margins, partings, and thin seams, the rare earths occur, um, even within coal, they're not gonna be distributed throughout the coal, particularly in lake nights. Typically they're concentrated and very heavily concentrated at a margin of a seam, the partings, the roof, the floor, but they'll be in the coal. They won't be in the, rock, the clay or the rock above the coal. It still will be in the coal. And this can range as small as a three inch concentration factor before it drops off rapidly to <laughs> some seams where it's been a fairly concentrated about five times more than the rest of the seam up to two to two and a half feet into the coal before you start seeing that drop off. And this is kind of seam dependent on what, what you'll see. But as a note, I would strongly avoid whole seam sampling or run of mine sampling. Once you mix everything together, a lot of the lignites, the middle of the seam is gonna be pretty much nothing. And so you're not gonna see anything particularly interesting if you take, if you average a 20 foot seam together and there's three feet, a foot and a half at the top and a foot and a half at the bottom that are really interesting. And then 17 feet of background it'll just get mixed to the point where you just won't see anything in particularly interesting in that sample. So a couple of stratigraphic samples that the North Dakota Geologic Survey have done, just as an example. Here, we've got a five foot section of coal. They separate out into foot increments. And as you can see at the top, we've got 113 ppm, drops down to 40 in the middle, and then back up to 150 at the bottom. And that's typically what we'll see with rare earths where Top and the bottom can be elevated 
Sometimes one isn't, but typically it's going to be the top or the bottom. Or if you have a clay parting, it'll be at the clay parting. Um, also of note, where you have thin seams, typically you can have some interesting concentrations over 100, 200 ppm in these two foot seams, but those are going to be a lot harder to mine because those can go in and out as you go. Typically you're trying, what we've been looking for is a thicker seam where it's a reliable top or bottom of the seam that you could selectively strip off before you go into the rest of your mining that we've been aiming for as targets. Here we've got 10, almost a 10 foot seam, pretty much the same event. And this is why you should avoid whole coal sampling. Bottom is 170, top's 100, and in the middle we're at 20 and below 20 for some samples. And so if you were to mix this together, I'd be stunned if the average was over 50. But here you've got probably a foot and a half to two feet up north of 100 ppm here, probably about six inches of over 100 ppm here. All, all together, pretty good. But if you just mix the whole seam up together, you're going to dilute it out. So mention stratigraphic sampling going into the lateral direction or the X, Y, essentially not Z. Within the specific strata within the coal, um, UND and NDGS has done some sampling that it looks to be fairly consistent. It'll be plus or minus 25% concentration from an average, but that's going out 100, 200 yards in multiple directions. And it's still roughly hitting that same spot. In a mined sample, we looked at a sample four miles away, but it was still, I think, within 30% of the average of the other field. And so it was still fairly high in those areas. Um, once again, it can move in and out, and there are areas where it's going to be better or, or worse just because coal is very heterogeneous. But generally, laterally, things seem to be consistent. Even if the set strata separates, if you have one coal seam that breaks into two, the top of the overall seam will still be high in that, in that second seam. Or if there's faulting, we still see the same rare earth concentration popping up at the top of wherever that strata lands, which we found interesting to date. <coughs> so of the criticals said, the lanthanide series scanometrium are definitely yeses to look for. For other criticals, um, from what we've seen, anywhere the rare earths spike in concentration, the criticals tend to spike as well, or at the very least, they'll spike where the rare earths should, at the top of a seam, at the bottom of the seam and a margin. Um, the <coughs> six elements we've seen that are kind of present in measurable quantities and interesting are germanium, gallium, molybdenum, cobalt, nickel, and zinc. Germanium and gallium are the real prize winners in terms of value because these are hundreds of dollars a pound, if not thousands of dollars a pound for metals. We've seen some very elevated molybdenum in some lignites that are favorable. And then while there is cobalt, nickel, and zinc, none of those are worth enough and there's not enough in them, still double digit PPMs, that it's not gonna be very economically viable or interesting to separate those. But there is enough germanium and gallium and molybdenum in some coals that we do look at trying to recover those into a separatable stream. <coughs> and as a note, so like for germanium and gallium where the, if I recall the upper crustal continental average is about two or three parts per million. We've found some lignites where these exceed 500 parts per million. We found some lignites in active mines where these exceed 40 to 50 parts per million on coal basis, not on ash basis. And so they, they are there and can be fairly economically interesting, in some cases exceeding the rare earth value, but kind of just depends on what seam you hit. So going into sort of the last stretch, extracting the rare earths and what we're looking at there. So the three forms the rare earths can exist, either a mineral in the coal, binding to clay in the coal or organically bound in the coal. They extract kind of differently and you'd want to take different approaches. And so you do have to kind of, when you 
know what your resource is, you do have to design your process about how it's associated there. So for the minerals, you'll have to convert a solid state mineral and that'll take time, heat, excessive acid concentration to convert. And like for an example, commonly to dissolve the phosphate minerals, you have to acid bake with sulfuric acid at elevated temp and at maximum 98% concentration to convert the phosphates to sulfates. And even then that still takes some time and, and 300, 400 degrees C to do clay bound. You'll have to ionically replace these if they're unabsorbed with some lixiviant, ammonium, potassium, sodium, just to essentially replace the charge. Um, once again, like for the ionids are plays Southeast China, ammonium sulfate, recover the ion exchangeable rare earths, and then the organic bound rare earths. There's two mechanisms to replace this. Um, really the, the primary mechanism is you need H plus ions from an acid to replace, to essentially protonate the organic group you're, you're removing them from. However, if you have more strongly bound ions than the ion you're taking off, those strongly bound ions can actually deprotonate that group and give you your H plus back. And so it is possible to use your tetravalence or even, high, even more strongly bound elements in the rare earths as a method of getting them without you consuming acid. <coughs> so based on this, do some chemical fractionation, fraction using a sequential multiple solvent thing where the water will dissolve some carbonates. Ammonium acetate in this case will pull off those ion adsorbed clays. And then dilute HCl will get you your the rest of your carbonate minerals and some of your organic associations. Typically your phosphate minerals are hard to dissolve at this point, but you should be able to see the difference between all of them. So as a function of coal rank, for lignite, pretty much all the rare earths are roughly the same. Scanium is hard to extract, but all the rest are roughly the same. And as of note, thorium is in essence insoluble and very difficult to extract from lignite, which is a good thing. Thorium is not worth anything and it's radioactive and becomes a huge nightmare downstream. So not getting it is a huge, a very good thing going up in age to sub bituminous. Here you see this curve I mentioned again, that's indicative of mineralization, but it's still fairly high extraction across the board. So here there is a blend of mineralization and of um, organic behavior. And so it is kind of a bit of both. And thorium, as you see here, is much more highly extracted Thorium as a mineral is pretty similar solubility to the rare earths. However, thorium on an organic group is more strongly bound. And so you do get separation if thorium is organically bound as compared to the mineral. And then with bituminous, where essentially all of our organic character has been lost and we are probably just minerals, we see a very strong mineral behavior where we get almost no heavies, lots of lights, and then thorium is very easily extracted, which would be indicative of a mineral behavior again. <clears throat> Just as a reference, what not to the lignites before, this, this lots of lights, no heavies, is what your, your mineralization looks like in coal, whereas your organic complexes are just kind of all across the board. It's high, and usually they're fairly agnostic to what rare earth you're dealing with. So these other organic associated elements that I talked about, rare earth saccharides, not the only ones. You also have on your carboxylic acids, all of these elements that can sit on those and are fairly, um, a, have a fairly high affinity for those. And then for your phenolic, phenolic acids, you've got all your taste standard group ones and twos. Um, any of the underlined elements are your majors that are much higher concentration than the rare earths. Any process you do for recovering, you'd have to separate those. And more importantly than diluting your rare earth stream by recovering all these, all these elements you stripped out will have to be compensated by charge to protonate the group or be replaced with a different cation. Um, and by a different cation, I mean a more strongly bound cation would have to be the case. And so, Typically, it's just going to have to be H plus. 
And so you'll need driving force for elemental separation recovery. So essentially how these separate and the order in which these separate is gonna be based similarly on those carboxylic acid extractants I mentioned earlier. Here's kind of a example graph. This is for Cyanex 272. This is a phospholonic acid, but it still gives you a good idea of essentially the order in which things extract. And so at a pH of four, this is percent extraction into the extractant. And so 0% means you're extracting from. So like a pH of four, you will extract all of the calcium, but you still won't touch aluminum. Aluminum will still be fully on the extractant. You'd have to go farther to get that. And so in essence, each metal has its separate affinity. It requires a higher or lower chemical potential to strip and maintenance of the driving force is key. If I put enough acid to extract all the calcium, and even if that solution was pH one, this consumes a lot of protons, gets me up probably to pH four to five, and then I can't get anything else. So I do have to somehow get more protons or some form of a driving force to stay. So quickly go through the UND process and then wrap up the questions. So the goals of the process as we set them, we wanted to focus on the organically associated and only the organically associated rare earths, critical minerals. We didn't want to work with mineral dissolution because then that would add a lot of impurities to the process, take a fair amount more time. And yes, we'd probably get more rare earths, but at the very least we could keep them fairly pure and separate, segregated from everything else and not consume as much acid in doing so. <laughs> and how we do this, is acid concentration and contact time are our primary methods. We keep a relatively low acid concentration that we replenish as H plus is consumed. And then our contact time, the entire wetted time is less than an hour and a half, including from the instant the coal hits water to the point where water has been, it's been dewatered in filtering. So it's very rapid so that we don't have pyrite oxidation and dissolution and significant calcite um, conversion. So that's primarily what we're trying to avoid is those demineralization, but mainly just strip the organic stream and then send it on its way. Then the rare earths have to be separated. Uh, admit, ideally minimize the number of steps and we've been trying to avoid an excess unit due to the cost headaches associated with scanning iron as well as coal not being a homogenous um, material. If the concentration fluctuates significantly, your solvent extraction unit has to be suitably oversized to be able to handle that, which just adds even more costs and more steps. So the flow sheet where we have essentially three major processes, we'll leach it, leach the coal with some acid dosing, and then our water in our, in our leaching step will actually come from the uh, water we use to wash our coal is our primary source of water. We don't put in direct water into our leaching tank just so we can recover some acids, some rare earths and some higher order, um, some higher valency elements that also in essence act as acid in our process. Once we leach the coal, washed coal will go out and that is usable as a product and there's some advantages there. But then on the rare earth train, we'll get rid of iron primarily by adding in some caustic, dropping out the iron, and then add um, oxalic acid, a little bit more caustic to keep the pH where we want it, drop out rare earths, calcine the rare earths to carbonate, redissolve them, and then look at um, separation of the rare earth train, the interlanthanide separation. Critical minerals. DOE has been focusing on rare earths. So we've been focusing on rare earths up until fairly recently. Once again, the, the criticals of interest, germanium, gallium, molybdenum, cobalt are what we're looking at. Germanium and gallium are the two major ones we focus on. Those are the ones that in some rare earths, their revenues exceed the combined total of rare earths. And so even if you combine the rare earths as one revenue, it would be number three in the elemental revenues because these two exceeded individually. So we're looking at new pathways to concentrate on these as compared with the rare earths, but it's gonna take some time, whatnot. 
And the list is exhaustive. There's a lot more criticals in this that we do recover, but these four are the ones that have any economic importance that we've seen to date in our many samples we've done before in, in, the, in the North Dakota lignites. Maybe the Texas lignites are different, but we'll just have to wait and see. <coughs> also our process, we do focus on economics. Uh, rare earth extraction does not equal, e equate to improve economics. And as you saw, 90% of the rare earths are extractable, but we're only getting 40%. That's because we only touch those organic extracted elements. And the lower pH you go, yes, you do get more extraction and whatnot, even at these quick contact times, but pH is a exponential function. And so to get, lower, get a pH unit lower, I have to add 10 times the acid concentration, which just means that worse, um, that's lots more acid con consumption, lots more base consumption, and the value recovered doesn't equate. So in summary, rare earth binding in the coal can take multiple forms. What we've seen, organic binding is the most common for lignites, um, and how they're bound significantly impacts how you want to extract them and how they can get concentrated in the ground in a geologic sense. Also, heavy to light ratio is generally higher than the upper crust of the continental average. And these typically will take the form of heavy concentrates coming from lignites, not light concentrates. Uh, from what we've seen, aqueous infiltration is likely candidate for how they occur, the rare earths got into the lignite. High concentration near these margins and partings and these strong distribution coefficients over the majors kind of speaks to that. And then also, Extraction of the pH lignites is based on the pH and an affinity gradient. And it's, it's these gr affinity gradients are set by the organic concentration of the elements, not the total. So as a note, iron, calcium, and aluminum are far more present in coal than just the organic fraction. And so discerning which of those are an organic basis versus the mineral basis can be difficult just to see how your lignite is gonna extract. So. With that, hopefully I haven't gone way too over on time and I can take questions. Um, thank you so much, um, Noran, that was perfect. Um, I really appreciate um, all the insights you provide. Um, so um, just to um, kick off uh, the questions, how long did it take you guys to figure out uh, the rare earths were in the organics and not in the mineral phase? And um, it took UND about a year of work to look into that. I actually got hired on pretty much the month after they discovered the organics, so I didn't get to be a part of that discovery myself. But it took them about a year of doing a lot of SEM work and not finding rare earth minerals or finding rare earth minerals that do not have the amount of rare earths that match up with what's going on. And trying to right why the rare earths were more extractable from lignite than the other coals, despite it should be the same mineral formation in both. So it did take about a year of work to kind of dis discover, okay, they are in the organic phase and we need to approach this differently and how we get them. Right. Um, so um, uh, Richard, would you like to ask your question? I see you have a question in chat. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll go ahead and ask. There we them. go. Let me. I, I'm unmuted now. I think. Yeah. Okay. So, so my question is 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 interesting. I actually intuitively am not surprised by the distribution at all. Um, that where these occur relative to the lignite seam as a whole. But I, I'm trying to envision, given the enrichment as as very very thin skins on this seam, how would you effectively efficiently maybe is a better word mine this that's a great question so most of the lignite mines in the u.s i'm guessing the texas lignite mine mines are the same way are surface mines yep. um, and we've talked with north american coal bni all the miners um at essentially asking them how do i skim off the top two feet there are um 
mining methods that can get us up to three to six inch um, coverage. But more importantly, we've get, we're working on another project separately where we're looking at a um, belt fed um, sorter that would be able to then sort the rare earths as you mine it. And so we're, we, we've considered both options and we are pursuing both options in terms of cost and economics to essentially how do I dig up only the first nine inches of the coal and then send the rest, rest of the nine feet of the coal somewhere else, whatnot, or how do I sort the coal once it's all been dug up together? Yeah, I, I, I guess the, the, uh, the, the irony here would be if you're mining this coal for rare earth elements that are notionally going to go into things like wind turbines to reduce carbon footprint, you'd kind of really not like to have the rest of the lignite going to combustion. Yes. Because you can't get too much nastier than that. Yeah, so I mean, in essence, if you want, so then you'll have to be pickier about which seams you go after. So I mean, like for instance, if I'm going after an active mine seam and I'm saying, hey, can I have the top foot of the active mine seam? My mining costs in the ballpark that we've been estimating are like 15 bucks a ton. Even for those thin seams we're asking for, it's relatively cheap. Whereas if I say, hey, I'd like, this mine to just be rare earths and just focus on this, then we start getting into $30, $40 a ton. And this is once again, 100, 200, 300 PPMs. That's a lot of lignite. So yeah. your mining cost does balloon quickly. Yeah, I, I having spent some time in the, in the coal business, I, and, and in fact, collective coal mining, um, I, I, I would, I would say that your, your dilution in this process, even if you've got careful mining is gonna be a big, big issue. So if you have some sort of a belt fed sorter, then subsequent to that, that's great. Then you have a way to clean that up before it goes into processing. I, if, I, if I might have one more question, cause this one's been burning here as you've been talking about this. You say you see this enrichment in lignites, but you typically don't see it in the higher rank coals. But why do you get this rare earth element enrichment in coal ashes, say from combustion of bituminous coals? So I was saying you get, you're having an organic enrichment in the lignites. So yeah. my, my theory is the organic enrichment occurred in the bituminous and subbituminous coals as well, but essentially then minerals either migrated out of the seam to margins, whatnot. And I mean, there, there are plenty of cases where you do see enriched rare earths in those coals, they're just no longer in that organic phase. So it's, he found, so I mean, it's, they're, they're still in that phase and they, they, you still can combust them to get the ash. And for lignites, you can combust them to get the ash too. But then you have, you have to deal with the glasses of your fly ash that you have yes. to work through. And so there's a lot of other challenges. Right. We found that trying to get them out of this organic phase is probably going to be the cheapest. And it's mainly just a, for, for a plant to exist on its own, it has to be cheap and economical. And so we've been focusing on that front mostly. That, that, that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, Toti, would you like to ask? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Hey, the, Nolan, that was really nice. Kind of a cradle to grave look at the, the whole process. Just building off of what Richard said, that I mean that it really does come across as just this conversion of coal to rare earth elements to make batteries. But I guess the the question I've got is on the uh, on that schematic you had of the um, extraction. Is it is there fresh water going into this extraction process? And like, what's the chemistry or what's the the wastewater effluent from this whole process? What's that water look like? So there, it is fresh water going into the process. So. ID, we're, we're, we're actually doing some experiments now to figure out how unclean the water can be and we can still tolerate and the process still work remotely well. So we're doing that processing now, but um, the effluents, um, one big thing I, don't, I didn't really touch on, so I, I didn't stress, so how I mentioned those polyvalents, the, the, that you can replace a rare earth with a more strongly bound ion in your coal as you extract it. Thorium and uranium are some of those elements. So we actually extract almost none of them. We're, <laughs> they're, we're remarkably low radiation. The, the combined concentration of them are typically in our, in our concentrates. So in the final 
most concentrated they'll be are still 0.02 percent 0.03 percent very very low compared to like mountain pass is just sitting at four percent or three percent so we're hundreds of times more dilute than others the um what wastewater stream we are doing some work to figure out exactly what the best way to clean that up is because you do have a lot of weird elements you won't see in normal streams because you do have a little cadmium cobalt whatnot some elements that just came along for the ride and aren't there but typically those are sub ppm or a ppm levels gotcha and that thorium and the uranium that they're almost that, you keep that out just because like chemistry or you keep that out because you want to keep the the rad limits or low for your uh, product so we, we want to keep it low and so i mean it's those and i mean despite uranium being a critical mineral unless you recover it purely it's going to be more of a problem than it is a benefit and so we're we're trying to just and one of the reasons we do actually stay lower on the rare earth recovery side is we stay at fairly high pHs to stay away from thorium and uranium. Cool. Typically, really our extraction nice of those are sub 10 percent. Great. Thank you. It's good. Uh, thanks, Toti. Uh, Charles, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Noam, by the way, for a great talk about the lignites. Um, I was surprised because a lot of your findings, um, they seem certainly on the money because we see them in subbituminous coals in Wyoming too. Um, and like you, we discounted tonsteins um, as the source for these rare earth elements. However, you, you settled on water that was transporting humic acid and rare earth from a long ways away um, into these coals. Why can't the rare earths be sourced from airfall dust or fine particulate mud that was introduced to the coal bog while the coal was being laid down? Why can't it be self-sourced like that? So, I mean, that's certainly a possibility. And I'm, once again, I'm not claiming I know this yet. I'm also not a geologist myself, so I am <laughs> speculation on speculation. But I mean, so, some things we found is, um, particularly around like glacial paleo channels, the rare earths seem to be very concentrated. And then essentially radially, as you walk away from the channel, they start falling away a little bit. And so that kind of keyed us in, okay, maybe this is a water relation that around this paleo channel, this glacier carved, there's a lot of rare earths. There's no coal in the middle, right where the coal starts, there's a lot. And then it still is fairly high as you drift away, but it's, slowly falling off so i mean it it's possible there's other mechanisms and i'm not going to claim that we know everything yet and i'm definitely not going to claim that i know everything but it's from what we've seen it and also the in areas where the top of the coal is enriched more often than not it's like i am sandstone it's something that's porous above it where water could come down from from above and then in areas where the floor is concentrated, typically it's an impermeable layer there. And so there's a few things where like, it's enough coincidence that we've kind of speculated on this side, but it's still not enough where I can definitively say, this is how it forms. It's good enough by my standards. Uh, this is a train of thought that um, Avin and I could definitely ride as well. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thanks, Charles. And then uh, Nate, uh, would you like to unmute? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just curious. I mean, I do a little bit of work in my lab on coal fly ash and looking at this sort of thing. I'm just curious how lignite versus coal fly ash has prospective ores <laughs> uh, compare. Um, yep. So, I mean, for fly ashes, for lignite fly ashes specifically, you're particularly North Dakota lignite, just to be even more specific, where there's a lot of sodium and alkali there, they're okay to extract, but they're still not great. It's just because a lot of the times they get tied into the glass, the flash, and if you have to break down the glass, you have to get to a lot more concentrated acid or base and or start adding temperature, and so costs go up pretty quickly. Um, so it's one where We've looked at it a tiny bit. Um, the ERC at UND, Energy and Environmental Research Center has looked at it. 
but it's one where at least on a cost basis, we expect it to be significantly higher. You'd have to find a very unique ore that very unique flash that for some reason didn't become a glass. Maybe you fired it in a uh, fluidized bed combustor so you have lower temperatures so it doesn't fuse. Something like that to, to get a ore that would be more amenable to separation. Um, anybody else, if you'd like to unmute yourself, go ahead, Tristan. Um, can you talk about the waste products that you're getting a little, just a little bit more about the waste products that you get from your process and, you know, going forward to a large scale uh, development of this, what would be, you know, how would you deal with those waste products? Yeah. So, I mean, the waste products, you've got our wastewater discharge, which we're currently specking out a ZLD system just for for benefit of environmental things. And that way also we can recover a lot of water ourselves if we wanted to. Um, <clears throat> and that's probably gonna really gonna be just sodium, calcium as the, as, as the primary two cations in that waste stream. Um, sodium primarily just from all the caustic we add. Um, sodium carbonates are preferred base, but we add a lot of, there's a lot of sodium in that liquid by the time we go through it. Um, so that's one way stream. Um, the other way stream from this process is that iron rich way stream, which honestly we've, we, we've looked at potentially even marketing as a product. The thing is like 95% iron on the cation basis. So it's actually very iron rich. Wow. And, to, and the taconite mines are fairly close to us to the point where like, well, would you be interested at least just take it off our, off our hands for free, but then that's one less waste product for me. Mm -hmm. So it, it's discussions we're still having. Yeah. It's one where we, it, it's not really a, it's just ferrous hydroxide. And so it's not one um, where we really expect a lot of problems disposing of it, but it's more of a, where I have iron processing industries less than 150 miles away or 200 miles away might be able to get them to, pay for transport or at least just take it off my hands and I pay for transport because then that's cheaper than disposal. Yeah. Um, as a note, because I didn't really mention, I mentioned this just slightly, the lake night after we extract it is really a weird, unique beast that we're still trying to figure out what's best for it. Because I mean, we don't really demineralize a lot of it. We remove some ash and we remove some sulfur whatnot just through some processing. But the bigger thing is the organic ash of that lignite is exceptionally low to the point where if you extract the humic acids from it, they're almost pharmaceutical grade right off the bat. They're a tenth of a percent ash, two tenths of a percent ash where they were 4% earlier. And so it's, we're trying to figure out exactly what, what the best way to do with it is because I really hate saying, let's go burn that. <laughs> and I feel like that defeats a lot of the purpose. <laughs> But it is something where, like, at the very least, it will be a cleaner burning fuel, and all the power plants are, are really interested in saying there's no sodium in this lignite now, where sodium is a gigantic problem for the North Dakota lignite industry. Yeah, fascinating. Um, Charles, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sorry, I'm a return customer. <laughs> um, but, but Nolan, I'm thrilled with, with these lignite discoveries you are having because the I didn't expect them to match up um, with some of the stuff we work on out here. Um, did you mentioned that there were some critical materials that you think could enhance the economics of the rare earth procedure, um, and you listed six of them. Some of those match up with what my group has found. Did you analyze for niobium or vanadium as well? We have analyzed for those um, niobium. We haven't seen a lot of them, at least to the point where it's going to be significantly interesting. Vanadium, we do have a fair amount. Unfortunately, where I said 95% iron and that one solid, vanadium is another big portion of it. And that ah. vanadium vanishes into that one. And I'm like, so it would be a lot more processing to go get vanadium and vanadium isn't really valuable enough for us to go hunt out of that, that material. Titanium is the other cation. There's pretty much the only three cations that material is titanium iron and vanadium but 
Okay. It's just not valuable enough to hunt, but we certainly could if we wanted to. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, uh, you're totally right, of course. Um, we, I was thinking about it more because it might be more, it might be easier to measure one of those um, weird elements. Um, and if you could measure it more easily, then perhaps the filtering and pre processing uh, that you proposed earlier might be faster and easier than something that had to look for rare earths. Yeah. Um, and so as a note for other critical minerals, a really interesting one that we're still still exploring um, in our rare earth concentrates at the far back end of our process, because you wouldn't be able to see it in the coal itself. We've seen palladium pop up more than once now in relatively small concentrations, but measurable. And we've confirmed that, yes, it's there. So we're we're starting to try and look at hunting the platinum groups and see where those are or where those are because I wouldn't even have expected to see it at all. And every now and then I just tell them, I just have, send out a sample to standard lab, to certified lab and say, analyze the whole periodic table, please. Just, just why not? But then yeah, he said, this is odd. Did you expect palladium? I'm like, I guess I didn't, but if you're seeing it, it's not gonna, I'm not gonna say no. <laughs> yeah, I'm full of envy now. <laughs> yeah, but yeah cool we've, in, in rare earth concentrates, we've we've cracked a ppm of palladium now. So, like, nice to have. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, maybe we can uh, close it here. And uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening in uh, to uh, Nolan's presentation. And thank you, uh, Nolan, for a fantastic presentation for taking the time to to do this for us. And we look forward to working with you on the DOE project and uh, Charles and others also. So hope you all have a lovely 4th of July weekend and uh, we'll work with you later, Nolan. Take care. Thanks for having me. And if you have any other questions, just shoot me an email. Will do. Thank you, Nolan. All right, thanks. Bye now.